Good morning. All praises go to God. Amen. Here we are again. Praise the Lord. It's because of him that we're here. I just want to make one quick announcement before we get started. Just, just so we all know, guess what? Next week, or this week, it's this week, there's two people in our sanctuary. They're going to celebrate their 35th anniversary. Now, if they're here, I'd like them to stand so we can clap for them. 35 years. Amen. God is good, isn't he? And the best is yet to come. So, amen. You know, you know, I like to always say a little something. And, you know, I said this yesterday in the um, women's meeting. United Methodist Women in Faith. We talked about being a chosen people. And we talked about the church, God's people, and his possession. Because that's who we are. So my little scripture for today... You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Amen? Amen. We praise God this morning, don't we? So I have a few announcements to make. Everybody, do you know what this is? It's the newsletter. I think we should have a contest, and we should name this, shouldn't we? And then whoever wins, maybe we, Dr. Marcus, maybe we give him a Starbucks card, since that, that's my favorite. <laughs> okay. And anyway, I hope you're reading it. Betsy puts a lot of effort into this. So, um... There's a couple things coming up, an information and resource fair, and that's from 5 to 7. This is this coming Tuesday. And, and all the details are in your, your newsletter. We did vaccinations, and we're going to do them again, right, May? Yes. Okay. And according to this, our next vaccination clinic will be Wednesday, August 31st. Tell some people about it. Because according to our statistics, there's still a lot of people out there who have not been vaccinated. And guess who the number one population is? Us. It's us. Mm -hmm. So tell someone about it. I, I believe it's from five years old. 12 up. 12 up. Okay, not the little ones. Okay, sorry. 12 up. And I think it's all the, uh, all the different ones and the boosters. Okay? And, and sometimes they surprise you with a little gift. $50 gift card. It came in handy, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I heard someone I called, she said, oh, yes, I'm going to go to Camper because I can use that $50 for groceries. <laughs> so, we have a lot of people that are in the need of prayer. So... I just ask all of you, if you have a minute and you have a card, open this and write a card to someone. It's so wonderful to go to the mailbox and get something besides bills. Isn't that right, Amen. Reverend Janae? <laughs> Amen. And we'll, we'll go, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit. But right now, do you know what I want you to do? I just want you to get up. Get, get, get up. And just go say hello to somebody. And do we have any visitors? If we do, will you say hello to the visitor? Otherwise, just get up and go. Just go say hi to somebody. Maybe somebody that you normally don't say hi to. Tell them, good morning. I'm glad you're here. God bless you. 
Have a beautiful day. Have a beautiful week. God is good. Amen. Amen. We just continue to praise the Lord and thanking him for just being here. We thank God for our people who are online with us this morning. We thank God for those people who will look at YouTube. We praise God that we're able to reach so many people. We thank God for everyone in the sanctuary this morning. God bless you. That's right. Everybody say hello and get a hug. And then it's time to come back to your seat. <laughs> it's everyone just grab your seat real quick. <laughs> okay. The other thing is. Do we have anyone celebrating a birthday for the month of August? Any August birthdays? Oh, amen. Okay, can you stand up if your birthday was in the month of August? And you know what I was thinking this morning as I was brushing my hair? We should say happy birthday to July as well. We had a lot of people in July. So birthdays in July, you stand up too. Amen. 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 Okay, and we have a special treat for you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear everyone. Happy birthday to you. God is so good. Ooh, and the best is yet to come. Amen. Say it. That's right. <laughs> Will you pray with me now? And again, please, please um, go through this. Um, pa Pastor Janine, she'll make an announcement, a really special one that she's going to make. But please go through this. Oh, I almost forgot. Guess where our little ones are going to be today? It's the tea party. It's the princess tea party. It's going to be from 1 to 3, and it's at that wonderful St. Paul Hotel. And it's in the James J. Hill room. I know there's probably some of you that will be going. I'll be leaving to go there. But isn't that wonderful? And the other thing I was supposed to tell you, there's a visitor's card, and there is a card for us in, your, in, in the back of the pew. It, the green one, we were going through some names this week, and we realized we're still missing some information. So if you haven't filled one out, even if you've been here forever, and you haven't filled one out, we ask that you do, so that we can capture all that information. We're trying to update uh, the directory, okay? And if you're not getting the newsletter, please call the office because it means we do not have your email. Okay? Thank you. So now will you pray with me? Let's, will you just take a, ooh, a breath in mm, and breathe it out? Thank you, Lord. Take another breath in and breathe it out as we make space for the Lord. Oh, good morning, Heavenly Father. And thank you for allowing us to be in the house of worship one more time. Thank you for keeping us during the night, Lord God, waking us up, Lord God, and starting us on our way, giving us the activities of our limbs, Father God, and giving us a, a sound mind. We thank you for that, Father God. And sometimes, Lord, we do have aches and we do have pains and we do have griefs and different things that happen in our life, Father God. But we still have you. And we know that you surround us, Father God, with your love and with your joy, Lord. So we thank you for that. 
Father God, we do have several people from our congregation who are sheltered in the hospital, also in skilled facilities. And you know each and every one of them, Lord God. So we ask a special blessing for them. We, we're getting good reports. Um, we've got a good report on James's daughter. We thank you for that, Father God. And Miss Glenice went through a surgery. Mary Sanders went through a surgery. Mary Kay Boyd went through a surgery. And we got a, a good word from you, Lord that they came through that, those surgeries okay. And for that, we praise you, Father God. We thank you for this church, Camphor Memorial United Methodist Church, and every single person who's a part of it, whether they're in the house or whether they're online, we thank you for them, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, for the music department, led by our, our Dr. Marcus, Father God, and, and all the people who support that. We thank you for Keel, Father God, who's faithful, not only here, but faithful on the streets as well with 21 days. We thank you for people like that, Lord God. We thank you for the people in the sound booth. Where would we be without them, Lord God? Bless them. Bless our ushers, Father God. Bless our, our people who are opening the doors for us, Lord God, and making us welcome when we walk through the door. Bless them, Father God. We thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for all the things that you've done. Even if you never do anything else for us again, Lord God, we thank you for all the things that you've done. We lift up Reverend Janae today, Lord God. We ask you to bless her, Father God. Fill her full of wisdom and knowledge as only you can do as she brings forth your word to your people. So thank you. Be with us throughout this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to remind you uh, that for your offering, there's envelopes in, in the pews. And for those who want to use... I think it's, okay, here we go, Cassandra. PayPal Square, you, you go and see Cassandra, and she'll take care of you. Otherwise, you can ask an usher. There's a basket in the back, and you can even, uh, they'll direct you, okay? Uh, those of you who are online, again, you have the opportunity to um, turn in your offering through Square or through PayPal. If you have any difficulty doing that, please, please call the church, okay? God bless every single one of you. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Good morning, church. So to start our worship today, I thought it might be good to just take a minute and have a contemplative moment listening to this old hymn of the church. Um, it's one that uh, they had to go find the hymnal that didn't have a cover anymore when I was growing up. Um, but the words are really um, impactful to me and apply specifically to our message for today. The hymn is called, O For a Faith, and it says, O for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe, that will not murmur nor complain beneath the chastening rod, but in the hour of grief or pain will lean upon its God. And my favorite verse is, Lord, give me such a faith as this. And then, whatever may come, I'll taste, even now, the hallowed bliss of an eternal home. Oh, for a faith 
that will not shrink though pressed by many foes that he will not tremble on the brink of any earthly that will not murmur nor complain beneath the chastening rod but in the hour of grief or pain will he upon its God a faith that shines more bright and clear when tempests rage without that when in danger no no fear in darkness feels no doubt so Lord give me such a faith as this and then whatever may come I'll taste even now the hallowed bliss of an eternal home I'll taste even now the hallowed bliss of an eternal home. We'll hear now what the Lord says to us from Matthew. Good morning, church. Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 17, verses 14 to 20. Jesus cures a boy with a demon. When they came to the crowd, a man came to him, knelt before him, and said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Jesus, Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was cured instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly, I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. So what I hear in that is, if you only believe, all things are possible. 
So I thought maybe if we sang it, we might be reminded of it a little bit more. So if you'll turn in your African American Heritage Hymnal to page 406, there's another, I'll say, oldie but a goodie. Um, it says, fear not, precious flock, from the cross to the throne, from death into life he went for his own. All power in earth, all power above is given to him for the flock of his love. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. Fear not, precious flock, from the cross to the throne, from death into life, he went for his own. All power on earth, all power above is given to him. For the flock of his love, we must only believe, only believe, all things are possible, only believe, only believe, only believe. All things are possible, only believe. Let's sing that first verse again, because it sounds like it might be a little new to a couple people in the room. So I'll slow it down a little bit too for us, okay? One, two. Fear not, precious flock, from the cross to the throne. From death into life, he went for his own. All power on earth, all power above is given to him. For in flock of his love, only only believe all things are possible if you only believe only believe only believe all things are possible only Sing the chorus again. Only believe, only believe, all things are possible, only believe, only believe, only believe that all things are possible only believe that all things are possible if you only
amen, amen. All things, all things are possible if you only believe. Amen, amen. Thank you very much, Dr. Marcus. What a, a beautiful reminder and a, a great segue into what we're going to discuss today. Amen. Before we get into it, uh, uh, Chaplain Irene mentioned a, an announcement that I had for the congregation. And so I just want to turn your attention to, you have this in your pew, uh, this half sheet. For those who are on joining us on Facebook, YouTube, you'll see a, a link that'll pop into the chat for you. Um, but I want most certainly to lift this up for camper members because we want to have a, a good, strong camper show out uh, to a, a really dynamic event that is happening right here in Minnesota. So on Thursday, August 25th, so a little less than two weeks from now, um, at 6.30 p.m. in uh, Minneapolis at the Riverview Theater, Minnesota is hosting the statewide premiere of Mine, which is an animated series. It is an award-winning series. It got featured. Um, it had its world premiere at Tribeca Film Festival, and it just won Best Web Series with the American Black Film Festival nationwide. Um, and I am very, very blessed to have been a writer on that series and a co-creator. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, but it is to the grace of God that we got to do this work. And it was really about being able to have artists and activists and organizers and communicators and folks of faith come together to create a world in which we're all fighting for collectively, which we're praying for, which we're praying with our hands and our feet. Amen? And so this is an animated series. It is definitely kid-friendly. So if you want to bring your little ones, please do. But I have, I have reserved a set of, like, of camper delegation tickets for you all. And so I want us to show up and show out, OK? This is an opportunity for you to go get cute. That dress that you haven't worn because we've been in a pandemic, go on and pull that out. And let's just come and have a good time. There will be some free concessions, and you'll get to, to watch a film that uh, hopefully, prayerfully inspires you um, and gives us a little bit of joy. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, again, take the, your little half sheet with you if, you're, if you are, you know, QR code friendly and you know what that means. Go ahead and pull out your phone and just reserve your ticket. Uh, amen. All right, all right, and let us, let us get into the Word. Who came to hear a word from the Lord today? Amen, 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 amen. All right, well, I am I'm most certainly blessed to be before you, very, very blessed to be before you, um, and I just want to acknowledge, again, folks out in the booth, in the media booth, our music ministry, Chaplain Irene, and just your love and dedication, so, so a great, grateful and appreciative of it. Um, and the Camper family, most certainly those of you who woke up this morning and pressed your way forward to get into this building, and also those of you who are at home and said, I'm going to do the work to pull out my computer, my laptop, put it on my TV, chill at uh, Bedside Baptist, but to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So very, very grateful for those who are also joining us online. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you. We thank you for an opportunity to be in your presence, a presence that we do not take lightly. You are Abba Father. You are our provider. You are the healer of this world, the divine one who has created our souls and our missions and our purpose. And so, God, we thank you. Lord, as your word goes forth, let it not return void. Lord, let the ears that hear it, let it seep into our souls and bring about revelation and purpose within our lives that is more bigger than we could ever fathom and yet gives you and your kingdom glory. Yes. In your holy name of Jesus, let the church say amen, amen. and amen. Amen. So thank you very much, Sister Akudo, for reading that scripture for us this morning. I just want to reiterate uh, the last 
scripture in that text, the last verse in that text, which is 20, where it says, he replied, which is Jesus, y'all, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. How many of y'all, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a PK, I'm a preacher's kid, I grew up in the church, lived in the church for quite a while, Lord Jesus. Uh, and so I have heard many, 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 many sermons in my day, and I've definitely heard quite a few on this text. How many of you have heard a sermon or two about the faith of a mustard seed, about moving mountains, amen? amen. All right, well, prayerfully, the Holy Spirit has given me a little bit of revelation that'll bring some, some new breath into this text for us today. Amen. Amen. Because here's the thing. I'm going to be real with y'all. This is a, even though I've heard this scripture preached many times, it's always been one I've grappled with. We're going to go into why. But the thing is, is that as a child, I would understand this text very literally. I asked, as a matter of fact, my mother had bought me a pair of earrings when I was young that actually had mustard seeds in them to remind me of how small a mustard seed actually is. Has anyone ever seen a mustard seed? They're pretty tiny. It's a pretty tiny seed, right? And so I would think, okay, if my faith needs to be that small in order to do something, geez, how tiny is it really? Is it maybe a strawberry seed or maybe a grain of salt faith? that it's not doing these things where I'm telling this mountain to get up and do something and it ain't doing it, right? And so as I've gotten older and I've, I've prayerfully grown a little wiser in my own faith and gotten a little bit of discernment, it has become clear that it actually isn't this very tangible, concrete way of how we think about size when it comes to this seed. As a matter of fact, if you look at different translations of this text, sometimes it'll name explicitly if you have a, a, the faith the size of a mustard seed, but in a lot of it, it just says if you have faith like a mustard seed. And so when I'm thinking about that, that reminds me that this is way more about what is so important about a mustard seed. What is, what's grand about that that my faith should mimic it, mock it? And so it makes me think, what is it that my faith is actually made up of that allows me to be able to move the mountains that the Lord knows we all got in our lives that need to be moved? So very similar to the boy in our text who had epilepsy and who was seizing and who needed a demon cast out of him, I've experienced this very viscerally in my own life through my brother. So I have a brother who is two years older than me, but I've always been considered the bigger younger sister, not just because I'm taller than him, but also because I've had a particular affinity for him where I look at him as my little brother. I want to care for him. And it is because his life growing up had been hard. You see, when he was born, when he was only two years old, so I'm on the way, right? He began having seizures. And my family began to pray. And these seizures continued. And he had what's called grand mal seizures. So it is the full convulsion, it is the muscle spasms, and the very violent muscle spasms where he would become unconscious. You can imagine that is pretty scary for a family <laughs> with a two-year-old. And so they kept praying. They would go to doctors, they would go to pediatricians, and they would say, look, it's highly likely this baby is not going to live to five. As a matter of fact, there's a story that gets retold in my family of a, when a doctor, my dad, you know, he, I, this is where I get my height from. So my dad is a 6'4 guy. And this very short doctor tells my daddy uh, very, uh, you know, harshly that your son is probably going to die before he turns five. And my dad proceeded to lift him up by his white coat 
so that he could look him in the eye to say, that is a lie from the pit of hell. And my mom is like, okay, okay, put the doctor down. Put the doctor down. <laughs> but it was, it was incredibly clear that something rose up within my family to declare that we need to have faith stronger than that. So they continued to pray. And so after my brother, he most certainly survived to five. And so he continued, though, to have these seizures, continued to have these very violent seizures that were causing more and more brain damage. And so now doctors are saying, okay, he lived, but he is going to need full dependent care his entire life. He'll need someone to take care of him. He'll need someone to bathe him. He'll need someone to ensure that he's able to eat. He won't be able to drive or have a job. This is what they said, but my family continued to pray. And so when I was about seven, so my brother was nine, my parents uh, started, we grew, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and so we have Cleveland Clinic, which is a world-renowned hospital, particularly for brain surgery, and epilepsy is a brain disorder. And so there is a, a remarkable doctor by the name of Ben Carson. You may have heard of him. Terrible politician, but a remarkable brain surgeon. <laughs> and what he would do is once in a while, he would offer pro bono surgery for children who had epilepsy. And so it wasn't a setup like a lottery. You had to go through a whole series of interviews and tests and examinations in order to hopefully get approved to have this surgery. And so my parents prayed most certainly that their son would be one of the chosen few that would get to have this surgery. And so they continued to pray. We went through so many hospital visits. And the thing about his particular type of epilepsy and the seizures he had is every time he seized almost, which was getting to a point where it was almost weekly, we had to go to the hospital, which meant little Janae was raised by the church. Amen, because a lot of times my parents were in and out of hospitals, emergency rooms, and so I needed to stay with aunties and grannies, either biological or through Bible study. And the church community continued to pray. So we had intercessors going every which way, praying in faith for my brother to be healed. Now, we, when I was, again, when my brother was about nine, by that time, he, is, he was taking 36 pills a day. Some medications to, mon to manage his epilepsy, some of those to manage the side effects to the pills for his epilepsy, and some pills to manage those side effects to the side effects of his epilepsy. And after getting let down yet again from another interview where they said, no, we're not going to choose your son to get the surgery, my dad decided to do something different. And he decided to exercise his faith in a different way than what we had did before. He went on a fast, on a 40-day fast. Now, my seven-year-old self had no idea that he was fasting. All I knew is that daddy wasn't eating at the table with us anymore. He keeps drinking them real nasty tomato juices. He was losing weight, but that's all I knew. But another thing that I knew and I noticed is we weren't making those hospital visits. As a matter of fact, my brother had not been seizing and falling out. After about three weeks, he didn't need to wear his helmet to go down the stairs to the basement anymore out of fear that he would have a seizure. After about four weeks, my parents started to take him off all of those meds, most certainly to the chagrin of Dr. Carson and his team. By the time we hit 40 days, he was on zero meds and had zero seizures. Amen. My brother is 38 years old and has not had a seizure since he was nine. Amen. Amen. That is absolutely to the power of God, to the glory of God, and to this notion of exercising faith in a different way. I also want to add that my brother, not only has he not had a seizure since he was nine years old, this dude works for Cleveland Clinic and has for the last 15 years. 
He ha- owns his own car. He's had his own place for well over two decades. Like the dude is living his best life and moving mountains that folks told him were impossible. And that was because he was the byproduct of someone who decided to do something different in their faith. So, this brings me back to our text. Now, the thing about this story, again, that used to really trouble me, is that way too often, when it would get preached from the front of the pulpit, it would get preached as a story of, Well, if you're sick, if you're suffering, if you're going through hardship, you need to have faith that God will heal you. But if he doesn't, say that if he doesn't, and if you're still sick, if you're still suffering, if you're still going through hardship, if you're still oppressed, your faith ain't big enough. Your faith ain't wide enough. Your faith ain't deep enough. Or your faith is non-existent. And as I got older and I grew more discernment with my own relationship with God, I started to have conversations about the Lord, with the Lord about this and express the critique I felt in my heart because the live reality that I saw for so many was that, yeah, I witnessed this miraculous event with my brother. Yes, I saw people get healed in miraculous and beautiful ways. I've seen devils cast out and demons cast out of folks. But I also know God-fearing, God-loving people who are broken, who are hurting, who are sick and shut in, who are dealing with oppression, who are financially, mentally, physically, emotionally, or spiritually broken. And surely the answer for all of them can't be their faith is weak. So the Lord had me reread this text in what I call the JSV, the Janae Standard Translation, if you will. And so if I may be so bold, I'm going to read it for you today. So Matthew 17, 14 through 20. Jesus and his homies were hanging out, and they walked into a crowd of people. And one of the men in that crowd ran up on Jesus and fell to his knees. And he was saying, Lord... I need you to help my child. He's seizing and he's suffering. He's throwing himself in rivers and he almost drowned. He threw himself into a stove and got burned by the fire. And Jesus, and then he looked at Jesus' homies and he said, I brought him to your friends and they tried some stuff, but that ain't do nothing. (laughs) Insert angry disciples realizing that they just got publicly snitched on. Jesus turns to his homies angrily and says, what is wrong with y'all? Y'all really trying to hold up my mission to get up out of here soon? Because you can't seem to grasp the lessons that I keep putting down. How long do I got to put up with your trash? Bring that boy over here. I got this. Jesus then told that, that demon to bounce. And it came out expeditiously. He was healed instantaneously. And then with their hats in their hands and their tails between their legs, Jesus' homies pulled them over to the side because they didn't want nobody else to hear. And they said, yo, we really tried to get that demon up out of here. Why didn't it work? And Jesus squarely looks them in the face and said, because you're not yet taking God seriously. The simple truth is that if you only had a small seed of faith, you would have the power to tell a mountain to move, and it would move. Nothing. There is nothing you couldn't accomplish. So there are two ways in which we can interpret this text, and most certainly I'm sure you've heard ad nauseum one way, that our faith is too small. That it's not big enough, it's not wide enough, it's not deep enough. And most certainly we see, even in other, trans, in, either in, in other texts within the Bible, for example, this story is also told in Mark, that God told the disciples, well, Jesus told the disciples, well, 
you, you got to pray, you got to fast in order for this kind of demon to come out. And, I mean, what we also know, right, is that this boy, he was seizing violently, and he thrashed. And so it could have been that, that the, the disciples, while they had healed others before, it's much different healing somebody who calm versus somebody who's thrashing, and their faith could have been shaken in that moment. So they actually weren't faithful enough, strong enough in that moment to be able to cast the demon out. But if I put on my theological imagination about what also could have been happening in this text, I have to remember that, yes, we know that in Mark this story happened before, but also in Mark what was told, when we look at the text of Mark, I'm going to get it for y'all just so you got my receipts. Amen. When we look at Mark 6.13, It says that they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This was not a new experience for the disciples. This was something they did before. Actually, a lot before. So there has to be a real guessing of why couldn't we do it this time? Do we actually believe that maybe their faith just got smaller? That they went from a mustard seed to a grain of salt? What I actually imagine happened is that these disciples did what we tend to do. They took for granted what is actually the power of God and thought that they was doing it themselves. That begs the question, what is your faith made of? When we think about a grain a mustard seed. The thing that makes that an incredibly powerful thing is that it's a seed. A seed doesn't do squat on its own. As a matter of fact, it is a created entity created by the most divine being. And it requires, you have to put it into the ground, it requires the nutrients from the soil, it requires water, it requires the rays of the sun to experience photosynthesis to actually grow. The seed is important because that's a entity of presentation, but the divine has to act and react and enact on that thing. These disciples could have went out and they did the things that they were always doing, using that oil, touching the person, saying the words, and started to think, we got this. We're doing this thing. We say the magic words and magic happens. Forgetting that it is not about magic words, but a miraculous Jesus that pulls all of this together, that allows the things in our lives to work exactly how they do. Most certainly in my own work doing social justice, sometimes we can get into a space where we were strategic enough, smart enough, politically savvy enough to maneuver something so that we have this new piece of legislation, so that folks have food on their table, so that folks have a roof over their head. But let me tell y'all something, none of that Not none of that would happen without God moving in divine being with us. And God forbid we get to a place where we want the glory and we don't give it to who it is due. So I've come here to say, it ain't you, boo. A seed of representation, a seed is that representation. It's that entity, that seed of faith. It is completely dependent on the currencies of nature to allow it to grow, to create, and to be. Okay, so y'all not hearing me. Let me say it again. Okay, so your faith is cool, but it don't mean a thing without the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, declaring that you have power and authority to move things with it. Nothing you can do on this earth is impressive without God working it out for you. So yeah, your degrees, they are lovely. But you better believe God made it happen. Yes, I know you studied, that's great. But who gave you the brain to think? Who gave you the eyes to see the words on the paper? Who made it possible for you to get the funds to be able to go to the university that you went to, even if you're still paying it off? Who gave you the job to make sure that's happening? We have to remember that there is nothing that we do on our own. And that our faith is incredibly powerful to move mountains. 
When I think about this notion of, uh, we say oftentimes in, in church spaces, we're like, the Lord woke us up this morning, hallelujah. But I don't think we necessarily are grasping how powerful that is. There is something incredibly dynamic, prophetic, prolific about the fact that we are awake right now. I was talking to my husband the other day and we were having this conversation about faith and and he was talking about how, well, people have a lot of faith in science. And I was like, yeah, that might be true, but who made science? Because to me, to think that we go and we lay down and we close our eyes and we go to sleep and while that is happening, without us even consciously thinking about it, our blood is moving through our bodies, our heart is beeping, beating, our lungs are filling up with air, that every little atom in our body works just right, just so in the right timing, in the right metamorphosis to create a cell, and then that cell went and talked to all your nervous systems and your muscles. All of that stuff started happening exactly right to keep your body at exactly 98.6% temperature. All of that perfectly works out that you also decide to open your eyes in the morning where I think that it is far more prophetic and beautiful and amazing and dynamic and quite frankly, just likely that we have a divine God who said, you know what, I need you to get up because I got a mission for you. I made you in my image. I have decided and declared that your life is worthy and that you are connected to them, are connected to them, are connected to him, connected to her. And guess what? Y'all about to do something real dope for me. So I need you to wake up today. And so as I'm coming to a close, I want us to to really think about what are these mountains that we have in our lives? You know, the Bible actually references mountains well over 300 times. And oftentimes, it it is a reminder of just the permanence of a mountain. And of course, in biblical era, they didn't have, you know, when, when you needed to get somewhere and someone had to tell you directions, they didn't say, well, go make a left at the Starbucks. <laughs> you had mountains because you could depend that that thing was going to be there forever, right? There was this notion of, like, stability. God talks about the mountain as refuge for us. It is a space that is always existing. It is also often mentioned as a holy place. It was God's dwelling. So when we think about it, when we talk about this notion of moving mountains, it is with our faith that we can move God's dwelling to act on our behalf. That is prophetic and prolific and incredibly powerful, a power that we have the authority to do. And so when I am in this space with you all and I'm thinking about the fact that we as Camphor Church, we are in a moment I've, I've been here now a little bit over five years, and we're getting ready to go into our third pastor. Amen? Amen? That is a moment for us to really grapple with what that's going to look like and what that means, but also to lean in with faith and not just say, because I could say, well, there was a point where we had Gloria Roach Thomas, and then we got Pastor Bell. I don't need to lean in and pray real hard and pray that everything's going to work out as it should or that we're going to get the pastor exactly as God calls them to be here and that they are going to be here and breathe life both into this church and into the community that's surrounding it because God already does that. He does it all the time. In the same way that we think, oh, well, I'm just going to wake up tomorrow, we make plans and not even think, oh, you know what? God could make a decision one way or the other. Nothing, nothing is inevitable. And so what changes something from inevitable to evitable is our faith. That means that we can't just sit here and lackadaisical and very passively just hope, oh, well, the stewarding committee got it. They'll make sure we get a good pastor. I need all of us to be on our knees, in our prayer closets, talking to the Lord about what it is that we need up in this church. And have our feet in the space. Come into the stewards. What is it that I can do? How is it? What ministry can I breathe life into? What is it? Where where can my gifts and my anointings, my callings be used within this community that we call our church home? 
We're going to need that faith of a mustard seed. We're going to need the faith that is not just us doing the work, but it is knowing with full certainty that the God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who woke us up this morning, the one who calls us into this world, the one who says that you are good, the one that says that I love you, is with us. Amen. 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 God bless y'all. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. So I want to pray. I want to pray. If you are, if you are able, could you please stand? First and foremost, the doors of the church are open. And most certainly here at Camphor, that means that we are welcoming you to become a part of the body of Christ that this Jesus that we were speaking of, the one who kicks it with his homies, who walks into crowds, who casts out demons, who heals folks so that they are well, is a Jesus who is accessible to us all. And all you have to do is say yes. Even with your grain of salt or your non-existent faith, you can come to his knees and say, help me to believe. And so if that is you, Please feel free at any moment to come up to the altar or to tap an usher. We also want to open the doors of the church for those who are saying, you know what, this camper space sound cool. And I want to be a part of that mission, that ministry, and that family. And so you are certainly welcome to come to the altar. The third call is for anyone who just desires prayer. You are dealing with your own mountains in family, in ministry, in work, in friendships, in troubles that folks don't even know about. And just wanting to say, thank you, Lord. You are welcome to the altar. But lastly, I just want to have a prayer for camphor. We are, in a, we are a congregation in transition, and transition can often be good. The beauty of mustard seeds is that they don't stay seeds long if they're done right. But it does require a transition from one phase into another. And so I want us to be grounded in what our mission is and what kind of seedling we are and where it is that God is getting us to grow to. And to allow him to water us, to cultivate the soil, to shine that beautiful sun on us, that we move in the way that he's called us to move. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you. We thank you for being a mighty, mighty, mighty good God. From the beginning of the earth to the end, dear Lord, you are the one who raised up mountains. You are the one who can decide when they move or when they are no more. And for that, we say thank you. You are a holy, awesome, and mighty good God. God, I ask that you touch each and every person in this sanctuary from the top of their head to the sole of their feet, dear Lord. Fill them up with your spirit, God, and seal them up, dear Lord. Let no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Allow them to be the children that you have called and created them to be. If there is sickness in their body, sickness in their mind and in their hearts. 
I ask, dear Lord, that you call out what it is that holds them back, that keeps them from moving forward into where it is that you desire them to be, and who it is that you desire them to touch. Lord, you know each and every circumstance that folks are dealing with. You know every comfort that they have and every concern. And I ask, Lord, that you be in the midst of it all, that you bring your life, that you bring your anointing, that you bring your holiness, that our lives may change for your good and your glory. In your holy, holy, holy name of Jesus, let the church say amen and amen. Amen.